Um, when I was little, I used to um, get the bus from North London to South End. And um, I got the bus to South End, and this was in the mid to sort of early 60s, and it took me two hours to get to South End. And I used to go to the end of the pier at South End, and I used to go to a, a video game, one of the very first that was in the country. And all it was was a blessed te te you know, periscope where there would be a ship going across the side of the skyline. And it would go across the skyline and you would torpedo it. And that was the game. And I would spend all my pocket money doing that every weekend for hours and hours and hours and hours. Um, I also bought magazines like this called Commando, which um, really were uh, sort of the equivalent of things like Call of Duty now, which you could buy in the shops. And um, I also played with things called cap guns. Um, and I must have killed um, thousands of people in my head when I was a kid using cap guns. Um, but I'm not sort of a serial uh, you know, killer now, really. But running your <laughs> But um, the, I, the thing is, it's a game. It's make-believe, isn't it? You know, and this is what a lot of people tend to forget. Um, I love this. Uh, I will also give the attributions on, on the uh, Prezi that I put up later. I like this sort of idea of cross-stitch with sort of uh, modern games. There is uh, a big backlash. There is this fear of um, games as being something awful. Yes, you get rickets. Yes, you get all these, these horrible things from them. But in the end, um, we've been here before. I remember the, the ZX Spectrum and um, all the games here on the wiki that, that were out there in the, in the 80s. Um, I remember working with kids, playing a lot of these platform games in class. We've been there before. Um, 31, 31 years ago, you had mud games introduced uh, by the University of Essex by Richard Barth and Roy Trubshaw. They took the Dungeon and Dragon games and put them onto a, a network, a computer network. They took the paper-based games or the board games and put them online. And what was different was that people could play them in a distributed manner. All right, there was only a few people at universities who could do that. But again, a lot of people said, you're wasting your time, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, I actually do uh, have Grand Theft Auto in my house, and I do let my 15-year-old play it. Wouldn't, do it. wouldn't lose it in school, obviously, because of the sort of big brouhaha around it. And I asked him, I mean, I haven't got the sound file to play because you can't hear it, but I asked him, why do, you, why do you like playing Grand Theft Auto? Well, he doesn't play it in the normal way. He looks for things called glitches, which are breaks in the games. And he plays online, same time with his friends, synchronously, and they just go uh, and play the, not the, uh, the version of the game which isn't the game, which you can just wander around. You can spawn objects, helicopters, cars, anything. And they go around and find the different glitches that are there. Now, in observing him and observing lots of his peer group, I noticed that there's a sort of common pattern of what these people are doing. Um, when I first started uh, getting on the internet in 93, 94, um, I did some sort of informal research with some of the kids in my year four class. And um, I said, what's your favorite thing on the internet? And uh, a few that were on the internet at the time uh, told me they, they liked the game to kill Barney. Now, Barney is um, a really popular sort of children's TV character or, uh, in the States. And, and the, the site they were referring to wasn't this. This is sort of several shades on from that. But they, they really like to sort of kill, stab, uh, behead, um, shoot up Barney. Um, it's, it's basically, it is, um, it's uh, anti-Barney humour, basically. And um, when I was, I, at first I was shocked about this and thought, oh my goodness, you know, we've got these, these very young children who are into these really violent things. But then I sort of sat back and asked them, and they said, you know, well, it's, it's make-believe. It's not, it's not real, you know. It's not real. So I thought that was quite interesting. Um, for me, what's real, the distinction between what is real and what isn't, um, I would say something like drones that go off to a war zone 4,000 miles away, which are controlled by non-competent operators in this country and other countries that actually blow up people and kill them. That, for me, is something that is morally wrong. And it isn't a game. There's the distinction for me between those sets of media, media literacy and media um, ethic, ethics, if you want. I think that's the important thing. Um, 
So basically, there is a pattern here for me. It's the social activity around gaming that, that seems to be the case in the last few months or years that's starting to spring up. Um, there seems to be several distinct things happening. You have ad hoc communities of practice coming together through things like online, synchronous joining through things like um, sites that have real-time games, or through Twitter, or through forums. A lot of teenage um, gamers still use forums on the internet as a means of communicating with each other. They, they debate on these forums, they help each other on these forums, they talk about how to do things on these forums, they put videos up on YouTube of techniques of how to do quite low-level skills to get through to the next level on the forum. Now, I thought that, that, that's quite transparent sharing of skill sets. Um, if you think of uh, the traditional uh, classroom, if you have someone who's trying to get to grips with a skill, um, sometimes they're, they're a person who is not really given enough transparency in how to do that or a, a technique whereby they can do that effectively and easily and repeatedly. And their community, their peer-to-peer -peer community, often doesn't tell them because it's all single-track learning, parallel single-track learning. There's no collaborative effort involved. Um, a lot of these gamers are willing to create new learning exemplars using new media, especially online video. So they're quite good at using screencasting technology. They're quite good at making humorous little films which they'll put up on YouTube to show each other how to do these games. Imagine if you use that technique in the classroom for other things. Um, they like to subvert and repurpose content and underpin it by humour. And humour is a thing that's often sort of neglected in that sense, I think. Um, and it's highly dynamic learning. It's happening in a very, very dynamic way. People are upskilling themselves in the instant, in the moment, as and when they need to. Um, I think in the education system, it's the early adopters um, who are sort of embracing this way of working. And they're, I think they're risk takers, they're uh, self-starters, they're willing to jump outside the hamster wheel of the curriculum sometimes, and exam systems. They're highly reflective about their practice. They're highly innovative. They tend to blog in detail about what they do, making transparent what they do. They use trans social media in a very, very focused way for professional development. Um, they build extremely focused communities of practice with their peers. And I think they have the vision and confidence to, to orchestrate gaming resources that bind into the curriculum. Um, for me, um, it's people like Ollie Bray, it's people like Derek Robertson, the Consularium, who are actually getting academic um, reflective input from the things that they are doing, uh, out there pushing it out. Um, for me, it's the activities and the communities of practice around the gaming, not the game itself. I think that's, a, for me, it seems, that's quite a very distinct thing, as Theo was saying, it's the culture. It's the culture of pedagogy around that. And that can be quite radical because it challenges the current exam system, the current curriculum, and the current assessment system. So those are quite radical departures from the way we've done things before. And they offer new models of going forwards and new ways of thinking about how we take on the way we learn. And that's just uh, pushing that out as a few provocative statements. Okay? And that's my, my piece. That's brilliant, Leon. Thanks.